Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a really beautiful Friday. I think now the season matches actually, the, the, the temperature matches the season. So we're here again for great grounds, and I use this hour to just have the joy of learning for yourself and learning uh, for the people you take care of. We have a fantastic speaker today, Dr. Carrie Gleason, PhD. She is an associate professor at the, in the Division of Geriatrics and Oncology here at University of Wisconsin. And her talk is entitled, Enrollment Practices Matter, Community-Based Participatory Engagement in Alzheimer's Disease clinical research. And I'm just going to do a little shout out. She has a paper coming out on Monday in Alzheimer's and dementia um, in this area. So, so look for that. You know I always like to say something about our speaker. So Dr. Gleason did her PhD in clinical psychology at California School of Professional Psychology in Fresno. She also has a master's in clinical investigation here from University of Wisconsin. She then, uh, after her PhD, did a psychology internship at Western State Hospital in Tacoma. She followed that as a geropsychology postdoctoral fellow at the VA in Cleveland, and then did another postdoc following that in neuropsychology at University of Washington in Tacoma. She joined us on faculty in 2001, where she was an assistant scientist, and she was uh, promoted in 2015 to associate professor, CHS. She also has an affiliate appointment in the Department of Rehab Psychology in Special Education. Her achievements are really very impressive. Uh, she has over 67 peer-reviewed articles, 149 abstracts, 18 national talks, and she has mentored learners, whether it's in clinical teaching or hands-on, really at all levels of learning. She has nine active grants, including PI on R01. She is a site PI on an R56 uh, and a PI on an RF1. She's had some really fantastic awards in the area of leadership and in the area of her research. In 2018, she was the VA Strategic Priority Team Award winner for leadership in establishing the first dementia-friendly VA in the country. Fantastic. In the area of, of research, in 2012, her poster received first place recognition for outstanding contributions to the field of women's health and menopause at the 23rd annual meeting of North American Men Menopause Society. And her leadership potential was discovered very early in 2006. She was a participant in the AAMC Early Career Women Faculty Professional Development Seminar. We're very excited to hear your talk. Come on up. So I'm trying out a new microphone. How's the volume? Is that good? OK. Dr. Trowbridge, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, it's a great honor to be here. And I'm really, uh, as Dr. Trowbridge mentioned, I'm part of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So I've dedicated my career to looking at Alzheimer's disease in underserved groups. And uh, we came across a finding that caused some consternation on my part. So about a year ago, um, we, we found some issues related to enrollment. And so this has been on my mind for since that time. You might even say an obsession. And so I'm so happy that the paper is coming out on Monday. I encourage you please to do check it out um, for the full story. But the, um, so the topic today, we're gonna um, review some of the effects of enrollment. It sounds like there's some feedback. I don't know if that's, okay. Um, so, and how that influences our science. Um, so it, it, the findings caused me to question what I'm doing personally in the field of Alzheimer's disease, as well as what we are doing as a center network. So with that tantalizing introduction, I'll go ahead and mention that I have no, dis no financial disclosures. Um, I do have funding, as Dr. Trowbridge mentioned, from the NIH. And I, I want to start out also by thanking my colleagues. We do better science with these um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. So the, the work that we're doing and the, the paper that we're publishing um, in large part is what it is because we have these interdisciplinary teams of experts who can help me sort through some of the findings that we, that we were discovering. So an outline of what to expect today. I have four parts to my talk today. 
Um, the first is just to give an overview of what the infrastructure looks like in the ADRC system and why, why that is actually critical in terms of helping understand where the enrollment practices are developed from. The second part, I'll talk about the work that we're doing in um, recruitment of underrepresented groups and why this is still important and the effects of these, then the scientific effect of these enrollment practices. And then finally, because we can't leave it at the problem, we have to come up with solutions. So some solutions and conclusions. Um, I will mention that the, the, um, some of the findings I present today are embargoed until Monday, so please no photography of the slides where we present some of our findings. So um, I also like to start out, have you guys seen this before, where people present the take home message first? I love this idea. So um, the take home message from this talk is that actually what we, most of us write in our limitation section as sort of this toss off limitation about um, generalizability is actually a really critical piece to understanding the science. So um, how many of you have published a paper where you throw in the generalizability as a limitation? Absolutely. We just put it in there, right? Oh, yeah, it's probably not generalizable. But actually, in some cases, may be very critical in terms of understanding our science and, and the contributions we're hopefully making in a field. Um, so this, uh, this is especially problematic when our enrollment over, or overlaps or intersects with how we are, what our variables of interest are, in this case, race. So um, let me start out first by describing, peek behind the curtain on what we do for Alzheimer's disease research, um, recruitment and enrollment. So this is probably not that different from many other fields in terms of the efforts that we need to make with groups who are underrepresented in research. Um, there are some unique factors though with Alzheimer's disease, um, one of which I will mention there is no cure. So it, the motivation to participate in research is different in cases where there is no cure for the disease. Um, but there's other factors too that are really important as we consider how Alzheimer's disease enrollment happens. Um, the first thing I'll point out is that in Alzheimer's disease there's a, a push towards earlier and earlier detection. Um, when I started in this field we talk about a syndrome called pre-Alzheimer's disease. Um, within a couple of years it was relabeled as mild cognitive impairment. So this was considered on the cutting edge. Well, guess what? We've pushed it even farther now, and we actually have staging for preclinical Alzheimer's disease before you even have symptoms. This is a paper by Risa Sperling in 2011, looking at measuring and defining these preclinical stages of Alzheimer's disease. So you can see that there's a stage one, two, and three, and those are highly dependent on these very specialized tests. So what you have is ultimately what is a difficult diagnosis one that requires a sort of specialty group in order to really define and characterize the disease. So you need to recognize this, the syndrome, but you also need to be able to understand the etiology of that syndrome. So think about preclinical, what is involved. It's these intensive procedures. Um, we ask our participants to have lumbar punctures, to have PET scans, and we put them through a five-hour visit every year. Um, so you can imagine the intensity of that research visit. So already we're getting um, more and more demanding, more specialized. The end result um, is that diagnosis is happening almost exclusively in those preclinical stages at academic <clears throat> medical centers. Right away we've completely limited in terms of uh, who has access to things. We've already limited, narrowed the field. So this is a picture of the uh, center network. So here in Madison, we're the only Wisconsin one, uh, only Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Center. Um, so they're throughout the country, but they're always at academic medical centers, these centers. And you, this is just one example, perhaps, of networks that are relying very heavily on academic medical centers. So what happens is you have this intense selection process for our enrollment that leads to um, this ever-decreasing representativeness. So I, I borrow this next set of slides from Mary Ganguly at um, University of Pittsburgh. I saw her present this, so I'm completely ripping it off from her, so I give her credit for this. So imagine we've got a full population of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. 
what happens is we start our enrollment process first by including only those who are diagnosed. Um, data suggests that only about half of patients with Alzheimer's disease dementia are diagnosed. So right away, we've limited it right there. We then move only to those who are diagnosed at academic medical centers. And then we limit it even further by looking at those who we approach for research. I, as somebody who's in clinic, sits across from the patient, and I say things like, you don't have diabetes, you don't have hypertension, you have a very clean case of Alzheimer's disease, why don't we, why don't we ask you to enroll in our Alzheimer's disease center? So we don't approach everybody. We approach those who fit our criteria. We then narrow it even further, those who agree to participate, those who have the luxurious um, time schedule that they can dedicate five hours every year to this and are willing to go through lumbar puncture. And then they have to, for those who are in clinical trials, they have to make it past that screen fail. Screen fail rates are high. So it, it, we end up with a scenario where we have a very narrow segment of the full population. Again, toss-off limitation that we frequently put out there. Oh, our samples might not be representative. So how does this impact what we're doing in Alzheimer's disease research? So um, I highlight over here, up in the corner up here, um, we have a center that pulls together all of the data from those 30 plus centers throughout the United States. <laughs> it's called the National Alzheimer's Disease Coordinating Center, or NAC. So every once in a while, I'll toss out the acronym NAC. I use the NAC data set. Um, and this is the, the data that is collated from all of those centers. So the numbers are impressive. We have over 41,000 individuals at this point who are enrolled in the NAC data set. And you look at the representativeness. This has grown over years, so the representative, of course, we're well represented for whites, 80% almost. Um, African Americans, it's over 5,000. Um, and because I work with the Native population, I always um, single out how we're doing for Native American enrollment. And it's 253 individuals who self-identify as Native American. So how we're doing in terms of the population, um, so 13% of the total U.S. population is self-identifies as black or African-American, so we're not too far off in terms of our enrollment there. Um, but we are, we are off quite a bit, actually, in our enrollment for Native Americans. I will, just as a point of pride, point out that 182 African-Americans in the NAC data set come from our own center, and 59 of the Native Americans are coming from our own center. So we're doing, we're doing really well in terms of our recruitment um, for our our NAC data set in terms of our um, underrepresented groups. So how does that then influence um, our findings? So these data are available to anybody. You can actually go to the NAC website right now and request data. Many of us in the Alzheimer's disease world do this on a routine basis. We go and we get the NAC data set. You could also go a similar data set is the ADNI data set or Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. Very similar, there are, the data are collected at academic medical centers. There are these databases that exist. Maybe they exist in cancer as well. Uh, maybe they exist in other types of uh, diseases where you can go to these large data sets. So um, I'm going to single out, um, this is a dear friend of mine, so I will give a caveat here. Dr. Whitney Wharton published a paper a couple of years ago using this NAC data set. So, um, and I love her science, she does beautiful work, but I'm gonna point out how the NAC data set and its, uh, the factors of enrollment influence our findings. So she published uh, using, again, Alzheimer's disease center data, the NAC data set, and she looked at individuals who have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. And she found, um, when she looked at, um, in particular, she was looking at a certain type of blood pressure medication. And she wanted to know whether or not this particular blood pressure medication that crosses the blood-brain barrier could potentially be protective in terms of our um, progression to Alzheimer's disease. So if you progress from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease, um, she's, those are her incident events. And so she found that individuals um, who are on the renin-angiotensin blood pressure medications were less likely to convert to Alzheimer's disease from mild cognitive impairment. 
And then she drilled down and she looked within one gr the group that was on RAS blood pressure medications and she compared blacks versus whites who have mild cognitive impairment and she found that the black participants progressed more slowly than the white participants in terms of their cognitive symptoms and concluded that African Americans may benefit from this particular type of blood pressure medication than whites in their cognitive health. So I want you to put a pin in this, we're going to come back to it. So a summary now as we move off of our section talking about the infrastructure is that we've got um, a research infrastructure that relies very heavily on a, high, a specialized diagnosis as we move earlier, earlier, and earlier in the disease trajectory. We rely then on academic medical centers for our recruitment and our enrollment, and we use a convenient sampling strategy. The research processes are intensive, so we are again getting more selective. We don't have a blood test. Um, and, we, and, and this is replicated throughout the country at these various centers. So this is the, the forces or sort of the circumstances behind our enrollment practices. So moving on to recruitment of underrepresented groups. Well, the NIH, um, with a couple of circumstances set up what we are doing for underrepresented groups. The first, of course, is that African Americans are less likely to enroll in preclinical Alzheimer's disease trials. And I give a shout out to my colleague, Andrea Gilmore Bikowski. She just published a summary looking at the recruitment and enrollment strategies and basically saying that we are doing a lot, we are not doing it in a scientific manner. So we are doing a lot of outreach to African American and underrepresented groups and uh, reaching these populations through this sort of approach, much like I'm going to describe in a few minutes, um, where we are reaching groups by going out to community and engaging community as opposed to simply allowing um, whatever happens by just putting up a flyer, for example. So why is inclusion important? Why is the NIH actually saying you have to be mindful about your inclusion practices. So it turns out um, that this is an incredibly important factor in terms of health disparities. Um, this is a, a study published by Mayeda et al. Um, this is Rachel Whitmer's group um, looking at the Kaiser Permanente data. So this is the HMO data. It's not quite a population-based study, but closer to it than what we're doing in the Alzheimer's Disease Center. And she found that African Americans consistently are, have demonstrated a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease regardless of the age range. Right behind them, in most cases, are Native Americans. Um, and in fact, in the 90 plus, Native Americans appeared to have the highest incidence. So in terms of late onset dementia, Native Americans, African Americans are at higher risk than, in this case, interestingly, the low risk group are Asians. So that's, uh, it, you, typically you see a low risk group being either whites, in this case Asians. When we look at early onset, um, this is data again from a US based study where they looked at individuals enrolled in, in trials. So again, probably a, a, a biased sample, but Chen and Pangreas basically said that in terms of early onset, you see a higher risk in Native Americans, but also there's an elevated risk in African Americans. And in this case, the low risk group are whites, so along the, the dotted line here. So African Americans, Native Americans are at increased risk. So this is an in inclusion is a priority for the NIH. And guess what? We were not doing a good job when we first started this work. The NIH said you have to be effortful about this, you have to be intentional, and you have to do something to enroll underrepresented groups. It's no longer acceptable just to say they're not, they're not coming to our studies, therefore we didn't enroll them. So it's a priority. And the ADCs, or the Alzheimer's Disease Centers, are mandated to demonstrate their efforts towards <coughs> inclusion. So we at the Alzheimer's Disease Center here in Wisconsin, um, we, have, uh, we have worked with the local African American community and we've worked with Native American communities to address inclusion disparities. So in our case, we are using a community-based participatory research. And this is one that's a great point of pride for me because it's been so successful um, because of this great partnership with the communities. So I'll give you a couple of uh, background slides here on what we're doing. 
Um, we have service-based efforts. So um, my partner, Fabu Carter, down here in the corner, um, and she partners with Venus Washington and they lead a fitness program. This has been going on for about four years now. And what happens is we enroll approximately 25 older women who come to the exercise class and they then talk to friends. And so we've, we've seen this sort of propagation. Even if they're not part of the, re of the exercise class, they are understanding that this center is dedicated to service and we're part of the a community efforts towards building health. Um, we also have a computer class. So this was a, based on a request from the community saying, well, I'd like to know how to access my chart, but I don't really feel comfortable working on a computer. So a couple, we've done two computer classes now. Again, we get great attendance. And even if a person's not part of the computer class, what happens is there is a snowball effect in terms of goodwill in a community. That the, the research program is not there simply to collect your data and let you um, suffer the effects of an illness or health disparities. So these are what we're doing in the Oneida community. Um, we were approached by the Oneida community about five years ago, and we've been working with the, um, the Oneida Nation Commission on Aging, or ONCOA. Um, it, Oneida Nation elders are incredibly organized, um, and they are advocates for their own health. They came to us and said, what can you tell us about dementia in Indian country? Um, at that point, we didn't have much in terms of data, um, but we came, we started first with education events. They then asked, well, we want some memory screenings done. So we worked with their local ADRC, the, Alzheimer, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, to do some memory screenings. We also then responded to the ONCOA request for partnership. So we, uh, we go up every month for an advisory board meeting, and we are, it's a true partnership. They've asked us to expand to other tribes, so we are working with the Great Lakes Native American Elder Association, or GLINEA, um, to, to do education events sponsored, co-sponsored with the GLINEA teams. So again, these are community-based participatory research philosophies that I won't say we're, this is not something we invented, but we are certainly applying what we've learned from our uh, others, or on the shoulders of others who have done this. But the, it's basically this idea that you don't just go in and ask immediately for research participation. We know that doesn't work. You can go and hang a flyer at the local um, community center and you will not reach groups who are disinclined to participate in research. You have to be a, a true partner with the community. So we respond to the ask. Um, we give back and we build advocates. There are advocates in every community. There are people who are passionate about this topic. You then, a uh, very key point to this, you put them on the payroll. You say, what do you, what do you want to do? Let's put, let's put you in charge of the next steps. How can you organize this to bring it to the next level? And then you form advisory groups who can then keep you on the right path, so to speak. Um, so we have the Black Leaders of Brain Health in the local black community, and we have our community advisory board at Oneida. How has this affected our enrollment in the Wisconsin ADRC? So it, these are some key stages as we went through the years. Look at our year one and two. We, this was our passive enrollment of underrepresented groups. So the black, or excuse me, the blue bars are, are African Americans, again, because this is where we made most of our effort. Um, the red are the, the other underrepresented groups. Um, so if we look at, oops, I'm sorry. Look at our, um, the uptick over years. So uh, I'll show this in a bit later, but basically there are some key inflection points here. You can probably see it already, um, but there are some key inflection points based on what we were doing in the community. So this is, uh, it, so what we have are, are enrollment of underrepresented groups where we are going out to communities and making special efforts, right? Um, we are not doing that with white communities, rural white communities, for example, we're not doing that. So most of our sample of white participants are coming from that convenient sample of clinic, where we go to the clinic and actually ask somebody to participate. Maybe we ask an adult child to participate based on their parents' diagnosis, for example. 
So we have a, a situation, at, and I would suggest that this is happening at all centers throughout the country, where we have um, enrollment uh, happening in the community. So for example, here are our inflection points. When we hired our outreach staff, you see an uptick in our enrollment. And then we have um, Fabu Carter hired um, in year six, and look at it, it just takes off. Um, key partnerships were part of that inflection point. So if this is happening throughout the country, and NAC is collating these data, you have a situation where you have a division in terms of the enrollment practices based on race. So if we're getting most of our underrepresented groups by going out to the community, we're getting our white participants from clinic. In fact, when you set up an Alzheimer's disease center, one of the first things you're advised to do is to develop your pipeline, your clinic pi pipeline. Where's your neurology clinic? Where's your geriatrics clinic? You have to have that established as a pipeline for your participants. So we have recruitment strategies differing between the racial groups. And I ask this question, this is for audience members to think about. Is this happening in your field? Is this happening in the cancer world or um, uh, endocrine world? Is this happening anywhere there is a health disparity, there is likely a disparity in your enrollment practices? Very likely. So summary for our recruitment strategies for Alzheimer's disease um, studies in underrepresented groups is that we are making special efforts in groups that are underrepresented in research. There is a greater risk in these groups. It's absolutely imperative that we do this. But again, we are mandated or required. We therefore actually make special efforts, not just you know, we're, we're doing this because it's incredibly important to win this disease. Um, and the NIH is actually holding us accountable to this. So how does this affect our science? Um, and this is where um, the story gets really interesting, for me at least. Um, when we began to wonder this, um, for a completely unrelated topic, we were looking at, we were comparing blacks and whites in the NAC data set, and we had great numbers. So you remember we had about 5,000 individuals, African-American individuals enrolled in the NAC data set. It wasn't a numbers issue. Um, so we looked at this data, and we were finding, um, we looked at incident cognitive impairment. And in, in the next set of slides, I'm gonna sort out um, those who start out as cognitively impaired with MCI versus, I, can, I separate them from those individuals who start out as cognitively healthy at baseline. So I present two sets of data. It doesn't matter, even when you combine them, it's the same finding. I sort them out because there's a slightly different pattern. If you start out in a clinical trial in the ADRC as cognitively healthy, you have a slightly different pattern than those who start out with mild cognitive impairment. So the next set of slides will sort that out. Um, this is the paper. Um, look at all those co-authors. That's because this took, this is a heroic effort to pull together this story. So um, key collaborators um, were important for this paper. So this is coming out on Monday. Dr. Trowbridge mentioned. Um, so here's our Kaplan-Meier curves comparing blacks and whites in survival without um, cognitive impairment, either mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Um, and I just showed you a set of slides that suggested that African Americans were at higher risk, right? Um, so a little surprising that the, the survival curves are on, basically on top of each other. This means that blacks and whites progress to mild cognitive impairment or dementia at the same rate. There's no difference. We then looked at those who have mild cognitive impairment at baseline, and we found that in this case, um, being black was protective. Blacks progressed at a slower rate than whites to dementia. And this started the, the whole process. Like I said, this took over a year to sort of sort through what was happening here. First thing we asked is perhaps those uh, individuals were enrolling, uh, maybe there's a difference in cardiovascular disease. Maybe our black participants are healthier in terms of their heart health. 
Um, so we looked at, this is a busy slide, I'm going to try to sort this out, but um, if we look at survival, just plain survival, it maps onto what we're seeing for um, survival without dementia. Um, our black participants were living longer. Um, our, when we looked at diabetes and hypertension, um, it, it's not true. Our black participants do indeed have more diabetes and hypertension than our white participants. In both, uh, in both groups, both subgroups, those with MCI at baseline and those who are cognitively normal at baseline. There is one exception where whites demonstrated more events, and that was in cardiac events, so there was more um, heart attacks, for example. Um, but again, the numbers are pretty small, 7% versus 5.1% in those who are cognitively normal at baseline, so um, a few points difference in um, overall number. But the bottom line is we weren't finding that our black participants were inordinately healthy in terms of their cardiovascular risk factors. So um, we, we began to think more deeply about this. And this is where um, a, an advantage of being part of a center, um, because anyone can get these data. You don't have to be part of the center to get it. But I know the backstory of enrollment. I know that, that we do enrollment differently for blacks versus whites. So beginning to look at this, um, we began to look at what was available in a data set that we could then begin to interrogate the effective enrollment factors. And there were two key things that I, that I wanted to focus on. We had information on referral source. So um, whether you were referred by a health professional versus referred by self or friend. Um, we could also ask the data about who knows that they have a family history. Again, I think back to that clinical setting where um, I just diagnosed a parent with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and I've got their adult children sitting there, and we're enrolling in a study for adult children. So um, whether you know of a family history, I, I maintained, and the reviewers agreed, or bought it, I should say, that family history is, a genetic, is more than just a genetic risk, it's also an access to diagnostic services. So those were the two things that I focused on when we began to look, drill down and look at enrollment factors. So um, these were the options that you could select for referral source. As someone comes into the ADC, we say, well, how'd you hear about us? Were you referred by a self, friend, or, or um, a relative, or did you get referred by a health professional? There was also this other category um, and an unknown, okay? And I would maintain that most of our folks who were recruiting from the community would select that self, friend, or relative. They would not select that they were referred by a health professional. If they were recruited by Ms. Fabu, they would not put down that they were referred by a doctor. Um, family history, it was just a binary. Do you have a first degree relative or do you not? Okay, so when we look at a comparison, um, in terms of blacks versus whites in those two subgroups, we do see differences. The differences are in whether or not you're referred by a health professional. So if you look at the number of cognitive, in those who are cognitively healthy at baseline, it's um, not quite double in terms of the number of whites who were referred by a health professional. Um, and it, it's a greater difference in our MCI baseline, which makes sense. Where is MCI diagnosed? It's diagnosed in academic medical centers. So um, we also see a difference in terms of whether or not you have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. Again, whites were more likely to report a family history. Again, I showed you data that the incidence is higher in African Americans, yet the whites are reporting more family history. So this was the setup as we began to look at um, our, how we set up our analyses. We did a series of nested regression analyses. And we are predicting the adjusted age to progression. So we're equalizing your age um, at um, entry into the ADC, or Alzheimer's Disease Center. Our first model, we looked at demographics, so we included things like sex and education, race, and we also included health factors, including diabetes, hypertension, and for those who are diagnosed with MCI baseline, we include the etiology of their MCI. And then in our second model, we add in those factors that we're, very, we're curious about the effect of these particular factors. 
So this is, this is the full table. I'm going to break it down here. This is for individuals who are cognitively healthy at baseline. Um, drilling down just to those enrollment factors, I'll highlight those. So um, we do, as you noted from the survival curves, that African Americans and whites, there's no difference in terms of their hazard ratios. Um, but if you are referred by a, a health professional, and the reference point in this case is being referred by self, relative, or friend, um, you have a 39% higher hazard of progression to dementia. Um, if, you have, if you have a known family history, you have a 22% higher hazard of progression. Um, I have a, a colleague who made the joke saying, well, the, the solution is just don't go to the doctor, right? Um, the highlights from this particular analysis, not surprisingly, postgraduate education and female sex was protective. Interestingly, female sex was protective. There's a lot of controversy about that. Um, and um, being referred by a, prof a health professional, as I mentioned, increased hazard by 39%. Um, and those with a family history, of course, 22% increased hazard. Let's put a, a comparison here. If you have diabetes, the increased hazard was 21%. So again, a greater risk associated with being referred by a health professional than having diabetes, which is one of the known risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So let's look now at those with mild cognitive impairment at baseline. Again, this is the full table. Um, just drilling down and looking at those enrollment factors. Um, now you see a 40%, 46% increased hazard for progression and if you're referred by a health professional. So in this case, really don't go to your doctor, okay? If you have a family history, there's a 12% increased hazard. Um, and if we look at a summary of this, again, education. In this case, uh, female sex was not protective, but education, again, was protective. So was a non-Alzheimer's disease cause of mild cognitive impairment. So if you had mild cognitive impairment due to maybe vascular event, you didn't expect it to progress, and indeed, in this case, it demonstrates that you have a, a reduced risk for progression. Um, in this case, blacks um, demonstrated a 34% lower hazard of progression compared to whites. Um, and being referred by a, a healthcare provider, 40%, 46% increase, being a known family history, 12% increase. Um, interestingly, um, adding in these enrollment factors did not eliminate um, the difference between blacks and whites. It did attenuate it, which suggests that there's something about these enrollment factors that are influencing the hazard ratio for blacks. So what's happening here? So it, hopefully the setup has uh, basically led you to this same conclusion that our team was making when we looked at these data. So if we just consider the um, the distribution of risk for Alzheimer's disease and, and related dementias. Some people will be at higher risk, some people will be at lower risk. It's just a normal distribution, let's assume that. Um, if we are cherry picking from clinic, we are very likely selecting those individuals at highest risk. Whereas our community-based recruitment, we may be getting some people who are at lower risk or optimally getting a broad swath of risk. We don't, we don't really know that, but it, very likely the clinic recruitment is cherry picking individuals at highest risk. So as we're trying to sort through this data, going through the revisions of the paper, uh, one of the first things I did is I contacted NAC. Remember, NAC is the data center that collates all this data. And I talked to the director of NAC um, about what I was finding. And his first suggestion was, well, make sure you've excluded those individuals who have the genetic risk form of Alzheimer's disease. So we got rid of all of the presenilin mutations. Um, we got rid of those who have Down syndrome. We really narrowed it down. So the first thing was we tried to break our findings, so to speak. Um, so working with Dr. Kukul. And after, uh, again, this was a, a, a long back and forth process. Um, he finally, in our emails, uh, he's actually a co-author in the paper. Um, he wrote something that I think is really nicely summarizes this. So he's saying when the participants don't reflect the population at large, you end up with such a selection bias that it can't be adjusted for, and the remaining statistically significant results are spurious. 
and likely due specifically or mostly to the character of the character of the bias itself. He goes on to say, as we're struggling through this with the reviewers, that it's a difficult thing to explain to anyone, including reviewers, how NAC data can be fine for some research questions and inappropriately biased or fatally flawed for others. So here's where I began to question what I was doing. Um, I, and I, I thank my colleague uh, Megan Zilsdorf for leading me to this to this story, the healthy worker bias. Have people heard of this? No. This is apparently, according to um, my colleague, uh, this is well known in Epi world. Okay, so this is something we probably should know, right? Um, if we were it, the healthy worker bias um, it was basically written about decades ago. Um, when researchers were trying to look at the effect of exposure to, um, to chemicals in a rubber factory. And they were comparing mortality rates between the rubber workers and the general population. However, there's a, a fatal flaw in this comparison because the general population includes those individuals who are not well enough to be working. So the mortality rates, the comparison of mortality rates will not be a fair comparison. So I, I apologize for the very simplistic uh, description of what is a much more complex idea. Um, but it led me to this where I began to sort of map this on to what we're doing in clinic. So if we think of the general population and group A happens to be those we are recruiting from the community are um, where we're getting a greater representation of underrepresented groups and Compare that to group B, which is our clinic recruitment, where we're getting fewer individuals from underrepresented groups, but we're getting a higher degree of risk. So then what happens? We enroll them into our ADRC, and our design flaw is baked in. So we have bias where we have uh, group B from the clinic versus group A from the community, where we're getting a group A includes more groups, individuals from underrepresented groups, but group B, unbeknownst to us, we've included individuals at higher risk. So when we go to compare race, our factor, our, our variable of interest, we've already set it up so that our, our blacks, 42% are at risk compared to 75% of whites. Again, it's baked in. So not surprisingly, when you, see, when you look for your incident events, you've now set it up so that the white individuals have a higher incidence based on the fact that they have an underlying predisposed risk. So how do we, the, the end result is something like this, um, where we look at, again, our black participants are progressing at a lower rate than our white participants. So you remember I asked you to go back, I wanna go back now to that study by my dear friend Whitney Wharton. Um, where she looked at a blood pressure medication to see whether or not this particular blood pressure medication that crosses the blood-brain barrier, if it can influence progression to Alzheimer's disease. So again, this is Alzheimer's disease-centered data. It's all individuals with mild cognitive impairment. Remember that? So think back to this is the mild cognitive impairment slide. Okay, so as we look at that, um, Conclusion, where African Americans may benefit from those modulation of blood pressure medication. So this is the impact of our enrollment bias played out on the science. So I, I so to, to summarize this particular section before I move on to our conclusion and, limit, and the, the solutions, um, our enrollment practices are creating a baked in bias when we talk about when we want to make racial comparisons. Um, Dr. Trowbridge mentioned I have an R01. It is to look at race differences in the Alzheimer's Disease Center. So are we, um, again, we are, by our enrollment practices, are we creating sort of a fatal flaw? It's not just a minor limitation. So our solutions, are we part of the problem? So I asked my colleague um, uh, to go back and look at the data of are whites and blacks who got included, if you look at the exclusion criteria as we applied them to the um, NAC data set, this is our center data. Looking at um, who gets enrolled from a health professional versus who has a family history, we have the exact problem. None of our black participants were referred by a health professional in our center, if you look at the same exclusion criteria. 
So again, I asked this question. It began to ask, and I had conversations with, with colleagues and friends. It's like, uh, what, am I doing something that's contributing to this problem? Um, by doing my great community-based uh, enrollment. Um, and I hope never have to give that up. So um, the, the, and it was pointed out to me that, um, let's just go back and look at these data again. So look at 50% of the sample of white participants with mild cognitive impairment have progressed to dementia by age 67. 50% of the sample. Who, who are these individuals compared to the general population of individuals with Alzheimer's disease who are progressing to dementia at age 67? Maybe the problem is not in the community recruitment, maybe the problem is in the clinic recruitment. So the response, um, as we begin to think about the solutions, is that we do community-based participatory research recruitment for all of our participants. The second part of it is we make sure that our diagnostics are inclusive of underrepresented groups, that we do high quality diagnostics for all people, not just those who come to the academic medical center. And we have a model for this. My colleague Cindy Carlson leads the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. There's a diagnostic network we could tap into to reach individuals throughout the state where we could have a more egalitarian diagnostic system. Um, again, then what we would do is we'd move clinic recruitment out of that high-risk group and we'd actually be getting a better swath of risk representation. So uh, the difficulty of doing this, these are the problems we'd have to solve as a field. We don't have a blood test. We are working on it. I, I do expect that we will eventually have a blood test. That will be a game changer. We can move things out of the lab. But in the meantime, why don't we make mobile research units? I joke about the mobile LP unit. Remember the bookmobile? We now have an LP mobile, right? Um, if we can make it more egalitarian, we will actually reach a greater swath. We'll do better science. So our, it's not, just so again, I go back to that take home message. This is not just a toss off limitation. It affects our science. It affects our findings, our conclusions. It leads us to perhaps make spurious conclusions based on what a possibly misleading data. Um, and this is um, especially important when we look at how enrollment overlaps or intersects with our variables of interest. And this is where I ask you all as colleagues to go and think about how your field might be affected by this. How many of you work in a field that it shows a racial disparity in terms of either prevalence or incidence of the disease that you work within. Yeah, yeah. That, thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> I think most of us are faced with some kind of sense of like there's a disparity that we have to address. The disparity also ha happens to overlap. The underrepresented group is not lining up to join your study, right? So we go out and we make special efforts. Um, are we then sort of tipping the scale in terms of how we, uh, how we draw conclusions or what findings we, we may make? So I, I end, um, looks like I've got about 10 minutes left and I've got time for questions, but I wanna thank my contributors again. Um, key, key partners in this, Made for Better Science, um, my our, our lab group here and our participants too are dedicated to coming back every year. And with that, I'll accept questions. And I just want to, again, give a shout out to that paper coming out on Monday. Okay, um, I'd like to ask the first question. And my first que the question is, so is this such a fatal flaw that the study, for instance, on hypertension is null and void? So do you need me to repeat the questions? Yeah. Okay, so um, the question is, uh, is this so fatally flawed um, that the comparison on blood pressure medication is null and void? Um, I wanna be careful as I answer that. <laughs> so her first conclusion um, included, she had equal representation of blacks and whites on and both the non-RAS blood pressure medication versus the RAS blood pressure medication. I don't see 
it, that the enrollment factors necessarily would impact that finding. Where I would say that we exercise caution are the racial comparisons. Again, because that is where you see a clear difference in our enrollment practices. Um, so I would say it's partially yes, partially no. Thank you. Yes. Fabulous talk. Thank you. For thank you. I would like to add, it wasn't quite clear, you are a member of our tenured faculty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, but my question is, have you considered whether the fact that the diagnostic criteria for dementia itself are based on this largely white referral oh. clinic population? And could, could that in some way also bias your findings because the diagnostic criteria themselves are biased? Oh. Thank you for that question. So I'm gonna repeat this very important point. Our diagnostic criteria, especially as we move more and more towards early diagnosis where we depend on lumbar puncture, our amyloid tests and our tau tests, those are based on a bias sample. And are we perhaps set up so that our initial even recognition of the disease is biased, let alone the signs that we, we do using this criteria? Absolutely. And this is part of the discussion so um, about um, uh, a year or so ago, we came out with the NIA framework for diagnosis. Um, so this is about two years ago, and it came out during our big conference, um, the AAIC conference. Um, the Mayo Clinic group got up and presented the new diagnostic criteria for dementia, which included protein uh, measurements of amyloid and tau. And there were some key voices in the audience, which unfortunately I, I don't think are getting traction just yet, who raised their hand and said, wait a second, you're, you've established cut points and criteria based on a sample that looks a lot like Southern Minnesota. <laughs> so it is a discussion that's going on where I, I don't know yet, there's most of the detractors, I'm not sure that they are getting, um, much traction for this. But it's such an excellent point. It, it, ca it actually causes some sleeplessness for me um, because I do, I do think like, for example, my mom has Alzheimer's disease. She would never go to an academic medical center. She's from rural white Minnesota. She's not part of that story. Um, so it's not just our underrepresented groups, it's the uh, many, many individuals in the general population. Yes? So do you think at the very least we need to adjust for referral source um. going forward and, or look for interaction effects? That's the first part. The second part is do we need to go back to the previous analyses in the literature and adjust for them? So I'll repeat the two-part question. First is at the very least should we be adjusting for enrollment factors? Um, and the second part is, do we need to go back and look at what's published in the findings? Um, so this is, this is actually um, a conversation that I'd love to like include my um, uh, biostatistics colleagues. Um, it turns out adjusting for is not necessarily the best way to approach it. There's probably better ways statistically to address it. Um, I would say a starting point would be to look at the enrollment, the effect of enrollment factors to see if it's something that you need to address statistically before you get to the analysis. So just simply adjusting for it is probably not enough. Going back and looking at the um, data, I, I do think there are, um, there's value to this in terms of really going back and looking um, critically at the nature of the enrollment. How is it done? Um, I think in any, field where you have a disease that is um, more and more specialized in its diagnosis and more intensive, you're, you're going to have more bias in enrollment. Whereas if it's something more egalitarian, where you can do simple blood tests, um, you can diagnose it in almost any primary care setting, um, it does seem like enrollment would be less of an issue if it's coming out of clinic. because And especially if there's a treatment, you know, people will be more like more inclined to end up in the doctor's office and being referred to research. Yes. You mentioned I missed it. Uh, how do you factor in such things as uh, uh, level of education, formal education, or informal education? So the question about um, how do we factor, how do we include these in our models, the education component? 
So they are included, um, so we did a, a nested regression. So our first model included factors like education. So we included education in our models. Education did indeed show an influence. Um, not as big of an influence as being referred by a health professional, but it was, like you'd predict, education was protective. Yes. A wonderful presentation. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. sickness within your bell curve, but can you think about the distribution of some of these other factors that could have potentially been silent, unmeasured within your data, and could have uh, uh, led to some similar types of uh, findings, uh, like this, uh, uh, socioeconomic disadvantage? Yes. So, um, so thank you for that question. That's actually critical. And this is where, um, uh, so I'll try to repeat and summarize the question. What are some of the other factors other than race that are perhaps of, of interest to the field when we look at things like socioeconomic disadvantage? Um, how is that playing out in our field in terms of the findings? Am I summarizing this correctly? It's something that may actually not be as obvious, but it's embedded. Um, it is absolutely in there. You look at when, as soon as you limit your recruitment to a, a very narrow group of people coming to academic medical centers, right away you have a geographic limitation. Who's, who's going to have access to that academic medical center? You have insurance issues. Um, you have um, comfort level, which, how, how do you describe that? It's like your comfort level at an academic medical center. That's part of it. What is that based on? It's based on your sort of experience. Are you from, like my mom? from a, a farming community in Minnesota. Again, she would never end up at an academic medical center. She, in fact, was never diagnosed. Guess what? Um, <laughs> long story, but yes. Um, <laughs> so the, does that answer your question? That's only partly. And these are, unfortunately, things we do not have in our database. Um, for me, personally, my interests, of course, are racial differences. So that is where I looked. But there are so many other layers that are again, sort of baked into our, our biased sample. Thank you, though. Thank you very much. Other questions?